The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, it's Andrew Rocks, and uh, welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today, um, I'm sitting down with the lovely Belinda Marley Wallace from Everlesco in Sydney. Um, Belinda, welcome to the engine room. Thanks, Roxy. Good to be here. And look, Belinda, it, it's a pleasure to have you as well. It's always good. You've brightened up the, the room, um, uh, which is, you know, obviously translates very well to people listening. But it just if you could just visualize someone who's brightening up the room, then, then we would, uh, it would be perfect. And, and I'm looking forward to, this today because we've known each other for several years and I've seen your development growth and also the positive impact that's had on the Evalesco team. So I suppose to get the listeners to get a bit of a feel of where you've come from, it'd be interesting to hear about your backstory, sort of how you got into, I suppose, the financial planning industry and how is it that you find yourself um, as general manager or practice manager of Evalesco? Yeah, thanks, Roxy. I, um, like a lot of people I've spoken to, fell into financial planning. Um, I came out of uni and took a support role with one of the big fours um, and realised very quickly that I was not going to be there long term. Um, after about six months, I looked around and took an opportunity with a risk-only business, um, working really closely with one of the directors um, on some ultra-high net worth clients. Uh, that gave me a really good foundation to the risk industry. And what year was this roughly, Belinda? Uh, 2004-ish. Yep. Um, so that was – it was a really good grounding and foundation. Um, after that, I moved on to some power planning contracting um, in early 2008 um, and then mid-2008 – got contacted by a friend and said, oh, I know these guys, they're looking for someone. Um, they were a holistic advice firm coming together um, and I guess the rest is history. And this um, is the, the team, Marshall, uh, Brentnell and Jeff Threck, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, so I started working with Marshall and Jeff literally just as the GFC hit. I was going to mention that. Um, so yeah. so how, how did that go? Yeah, it was uh, a big eye-opener and a very steep learning curve. Um, I'd come from pure risk, so to jump into holistic FP world at GFC time, uh, yeah, it was it was interesting, um, some big hours, and but we worked really closely together and instantly hit it off, um, and I knew straight away that I'd be there long term, um, and yep, fast forward 15 years and I'm still there. And is there anyone? Um, obviously, you mentioned you work with a, a, a risk professional. Then you've yep. you've moved into working with Marshall and Jeff. Is there anyone, I suppose, in your your background or that journey that, in particular, that um, that that really has assisted you, or anyone has given you some guidance? Yeah. Look, I think after working with Marsh and Jeff for so long, um, and in such a small team, because at the start it was just the three of us. Um, so we have grown together um, and we've been at similar life stages, having kids together, that sort of thing. So I think their support 
has been immeasurable. Um, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today without both of them behind me, um, backing me every step of the way. There's been a couple of team members here and there, one in particular who came in while I was on one lot of mat leave. Um, she sort of came in to manage the team and I came back and we instantly just bounced off each other. She's now an amazing advisor um, and we've just supported each other along the way. So, Oh, fantastic. And um, when when you came into the, the team in 2008, apart from a GFC, this was pre-FOFA, um, you know, what have you... What have you seen in the growth? Because what's the headcount now in the business? We've got twenty five. Twenty five, yeah. Yep. So, so you know, you were you were uh, person number three, and 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 uh, not much to general manage back then. No. Uh, just your own diary. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, what have you seen, or, or what would you put down as as a couple of the key personal sort of things that you've that you've seen over the last ten years that have assisted you? Um, I think the world. The financial planning world as we know it, um, everyone would agree, has changed dramatically. Um, not always for the better. At the time, it doesn't feel like it. But if we reflect back at how far we've come, it's only made the industry better. Yep. Um, we may have lost some really great people from the industry for various reasons, um, but where we are today has built a much stronger industry as a whole um, and producing some really amazing people coming through the ranks now. And you mentioned, um, you touched on the fact that you've, uh, you've, you've had some kids, you've had some met leave. Um, yeah. So, uh, and you've, you've obviously navigated that with, with, with the business partners as well. Um, and which is, by the way, is pretty awesome because you're sitting here, you're, you're still full of energy. And, um, you know, when you said 2004, I found that quite hard to believe. What was that? What, what did you do at university? What was your uh, course? It was actually an international management degree. Okay, and, so you, and you did that at Sydney, and then you've stayed in Sydney, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Well, there is yep. a there is a body of water here. So yep. you, 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 right. You, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, it was very broad. Had no idea what I wanted to do. As I said, fell into this and instantly loved it. Wanted knew I wanted to help people. So in my role now, I get to help the team and clients indirectly, whereas advisors help clients directly and the team indirectly. I'm I'm the reverse. Yeah, and look, we had the conversation earlier, and and what I inferenced with Ensemble is that the we're all about the positive evolution of financial advice, and 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 the whole impetus of this engine room was to get exactly people such as yourself who've come in are passionate and are creating an environment for the advisors who were there to succeed, but also create genuine career pathways for people, not just client facing in organisations. Yeah, absolutely, and. Let's maybe uh, quickly change gears to get a bit of a feel for Evolesco. You know, it's, I'm sure it's a completely different business to, uh, to what Marshall and Jeff were kicking around in 2008. So, you know, you mentioned there's 25 people within the business um, as we speak. Um, how does your org structure look? So we've, uh, we've got Jeff as our CEO, I'm our GM, so we obviously work really closely together day to day. Um, and then Marshall, um, who's also a director, heads up our investment committee um, and is also an investment uh, on the investment committee with our license as well. Um, so that's sort of the leadership team. Um, and then we head into our advice pods. So there's five holistic advice pods, a risk only pod and a lending pod as well. So you've got five holistic advice pods. <laughs> And each one of those pods, what does the composition of that look like? So we've got an advisor with an associate who is typically an AR or going through their PY or looking to do that in the future. So this is this is also part of your future plan for your path. Yep. 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 Um, and then there's usually one to two admin support. Okay. And and in addition to that, you've got a separate hub for lending and a separate hub. What was the last one? Uh, risk only. Risk only. Yeah. And. Um, do does that infer that your holistic people refer into the risk only as risk specialists? Correct. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. And has it always been a hub? A, a, sorry, a pod structure? Yes. Yeah, we've always had the pod structure. The back office has looked a bit different, um, which is something that we've evolved and developed and trialed along the way, um, where we had people looking after implementation only or, or ongoing advice typically separately and then we made the call quite some time ago now to sort of bring it together and keep them as one pod so the clients knew who to go to. Why did you do that? So uh, the client, yeah. it, It's a client experience. Great. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think you're right. I think sometimes 
Uh, I've asked this question a few times and, and different people are at different stages and um, we can't disregard the client experience from the operational efficiency. Not at all. Um, because uh, clients don't want to be commoditized. Absolutely. They want to know who they're going to and who they're talking to at all times. But it's a paradox because we need to, as operators of businesses, we need to create efficiencies to ensure that we can deliver what they want at a price point that they're happy with. But at the same time, they don't want to feel as if we've done that exercise. So Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's a struggle every day. And yep. um, uh, I'm sure um, that, that, that over the years, some pods have got that faster than others. And, um, you know, it's, it's a thing there. Now, with the pod structure... Does that mean um, that each one of those pods reports like their own quasi P&L line and that ca cascades up to you and, and, and the other directors? We're actually evolving that at the moment. Um, we've gone through uh, setting a new business plan and strategy um, at the back end of last year. Um, so that's that's an evolvement. It hasn't been to date. It hasn't been a focus. We've just been giving good advice to good people. Um, but we're taking that next leap, I guess, if if that's what you'd like to call it, um, in terms of operating as their own P&L um, and holding the advisors accountable for that. Yeah, the A word. You know, it's it's kind of uh, – it's, it's, it's a bit of sweet word, but it does need to happen because um, – when everyone's accountable, no one's accountable. So, Absolutely. you know, I think that's it there. So you mentioned you like giving good advice to good people. Yeah. Um, what does an Everlesco client look like? What's a good person? Um, someone who wants and needs advice and is willing to take it. Um, they're good people. They're nice people. They're good to deal with. They want to take our advice. They've sought us out typically or they've been referred in, um, but they're just really nice people who need some help. And I think what you've mentioned there is um, they're willing to delegate, and but they also make decisions. In your – and although this is an engineering podcast, I'm just curious, in your taking on of a client, so when they've come in, how do you work out that? Like over, is it a one meeting or a two? When do you know that they're, they're going to delegate and they're going to actually make decisions? Yeah, we typically – we've introduced over the last couple of years a vetting call. Yep. to really try and nut out if they're going to be suitable or not. Um, and then that first face-to-face -face meeting, you'll get a feel for it. It's then typically the interactions in between the next meeting that are really the clear, de clear determinant. So both phone and email and just, yep. just whether they're responsive. and Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, having some experience in the lending game, if someone's not responsive to sending in their information but they still want a home loan in the next two weeks, it yep. becomes quite an awkward conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And um, so let's say, for instance, I, I was coming – God love you. That's, that's actually going to be a stretch. <laughs> um, let's just say that, um, you know, what does, what does a pod typically look after? How many – like what kind of family units do they look after? Um, do you – do you tailor some of the client pods to the, the, the life stages of the advisors or maybe give us a feel there? Yeah, so they've all got key focus that has kind of evolved over time as well. Um, Marshall looks after a lot of our retirees and pre-retirees. Um, a couple of the younger advisors look after more higher net worth wealth accumulator families. Um, there's typically somewhere between sort of 80 and 130 client groups per advisor. Yeah. Um, separate to the risk pod, that's obviously all policyholders, so that's a little bit different. So, and then um, getting to the, you know, you mentioned Marshall does a lot of the, the investment stuff. Um, you guys are a self-licensed from memory, but you share your self-licensing with a couple of other really quality practices um, what, what made you do that and what's, what's sort of the, the reason why you do that? Yeah, so we stepped away uh, six years ago from a larger licensee um, and that was purely because we felt like we were being dictated to. We didn't have a lot of say. We had lots of scale, but we just weren't getting the say. Um, so there were three other um, smaller practices who – Marsh and Jeff had a really good relationship with um, that came together. So there's a boutique of four groups um, and we share at that investment level 
the licensee, the compliance, the marketing, all that sort of stuff. It's a full range, but we've shared resources, the big collaboration. We're actually all heading to Melbourne um, in September for a licensee offsite. Um, so we've still got that scale, that sharing, those thought processes, all that sort of stuff, the back office. I'm on the operational compliance committee um, and everyone, there's, there's a representative from each office. Um, so we all share push back to the license with any suggestions or thoughts as a group. Um, and it just means that we've got a little bit more say whilst compliance is still tight, we do have more say in the end game. And I would imagine that by uh, pooling those resources, you have you built an, an SMA or an MDA that, 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 that. Yep. So we've, we've using it, SMAs and they're, um, the models and that sort of thing are, are managed at the licensee level. So there is an investment committee that looks after that. Um, and again, each practice has representatives right. within that. So there's a representative for the investment committee and do you have a platform that, that you guys run off? Yeah, so we run off premium primarily. Um, so that's, again, managed at that investment committee level and then individually with each of the practices as well. And look, thank you for that. And then in, in relation to the risk, because I've had um, I've had quite a few practices on here and some of them uh, are pure risk, okay, and they obviously get it. Um, some of them uh, have done risk but kind of have been mumbling that it's hard, etc. And I've had a couple of practices that have a risk specialist in their, their organisation, okay. So um, has that always been the case? And... What benefit does that risk specialist person bring to the other pods? Um, so it hasn't always been the case. Um, it was only a couple of years ago that we brought in a risk specialist um, and that was as a result primarily of, of an acquisition, a risk-only book. Um, so we brought Dom in um, two years ago. His wealth and knowledge of the risk industry and it's the little quirks. He shared some stories last week with the team at our team meeting and the little quirks are what distinguishes his his knowledge and his brilliance in, the, in that um, and really demonstrates to us as a leadership team that there's serious value in having him within the team to be able to take that off the advisors for them to focus on what they need to focus on and he can focus on helping those clients with those risk-focused um, goals. Well, in essence, I mean, the financial planners pedal peace of mind. And in, in this regard, your advisors have got peace of mind that their risk specialist has got their back. Absolutely. And um, when we've spoken with people who do risk really well, it's that extra value add that you can give um, will ensure the outcome. And while we're talking life insurance, um, how have you guys built your engine room to deliver those plans? You know, how do you do it efficiently? So we outsource our power planning. It's not offshore, it's onshore, but it is outsourced from, from Everlesco. Um, we also, we, we use X-Plan. We're currently going through introducing Zeppo um, to work with X-Plan. So X-Plan will be purely our compliance doc generation and some modeling. Um, we're moving away from having it as our CRM. That will be Zeppo's focus. We've also um, using CDM. Um, so if all that insurance data will come through. Um, and then we've got Slack for internal comms, Asana for task management. The biggest benefit we've seen from Zeppo, and it's very early days, is having access to greater and clearer reporting, um, gaining consistencies and efficiencies whilst enhancing and improving that client experience. So I normally ask what your tech stack is, but I think you've pretty clearly <laughs> laid that out. And you, you're using um, Slack as your comms. And, you know, we're, we're going to speak about, um, you know, where your people are located, whether you're an in-house, outhouse combination, et cetera. But a tool such as Slack, and I was an early adopter of Slack back when I had my business announced 15 years ago, um, actually just had us ready for... COVID, which we never thought was going to happen. But um, yeah, so maybe just give us a feel for um, uh, the how you utilize uh, Slack as a communication tool. And then also, um, yeah, where are, where are you located and where is the team located? Yep. So Slack as a communication tool has been amazing. It's been a game changer. It's taken all unnecessary comms out of email 
and in to instant time. Emails yucky. Yeah, very. Um, so that's been a big game changer um, for the team. We can also jump on video calls in there. We can pin documents in there so it's easy reference. Um, no one can turn around and tell me that they haven't been told because I know it's in there. And when did you start on that? Uh, it's been, um, gosh, it's been a while. Maybe I think we were early, early adopters. So well before COVID. Oh, yeah, well and surely well before COVID. But it did make life easier in COVID when we all of a sudden had to all work from home. Absolutely. So speaking about that, where, where are you located? Where's head office? Uh, we're in the Sydney CBD. Um, so it's nice and easy for everyone, easy access for public transport. Um, but we also do have part of our team offshore. Um, so part of our team is in Cebu. Um, we work really closely with VBP, um, which is an awesome relationship that we're really happy um, we've got and we're really thankful that we've got them as part of our team. Um, we've been working with them for four to five years now. And look, I can see a, a quick look at your people on your website. Um, I can see all these happy, smiley, smiley faces there. So um, I'm going to talk about people and culture in a minute, mm -hmm. but um, and we might be able to touch on that. But yeah, it's clear that there's a there's an inner glow in the people in, in your business. Um, do you uh, so although you um, share AFSL, does your business have a board per se, or is it just the the senior leadership of you three that that, that sort of make the decisions? Yeah, we've got this uh, the the three of us. Um, we've also um, in the last six months, six to twelve months, um, engaged with Encore Advisory. Um, so we've got Mark as part of our board as well, which we have identified as a leadership team has been a bit of a game changer um, for us as a group. Um, it just helps us stay on track, holds us accountable accountable far more than it ever did. Um, we've been able to set out project plans and that sort of thing. All the stuff that we just have in conversations and it would typically fall back on me to track and make happen, we've got someone else to, to help us push those along. Look, and a shout out to Encore and we'll put, give, put some details attached to this of, of who they are and hopefully they're still open for new clients because <laughs> they'll probably get some. Um, and look, I'm a mad fan of having uh, coaching. In fact, um, my current business uh, partner in VBP was my previous business coach as a financial planning um, owner. So uh, holding holding owners to account, remember the A word, accountability? Yeah. What what we've learned talking to practice managers is they've got to hold people technically below them in the org chart accountable, but the ones that do it well hold themselves and the people above them in the org chart accountable. Mm. Would you say that's your role? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's spot on. And it's only really come to light that that has been and become a clear focus since we've started working with Mark and Tom. So. And so right now, um, is all of your team in Sydney? I know you've got the Philippines business, but is all your team in Sydney working in the office? Yeah, they are. Um, so we've got a hybrid work set up. Um, so they uh, work from home one to two days a week um, and then in the office. Um, there's certain times we've got them, we stipulate they come in. So for team meetings and that sort of thing, ideally they'll be in the office. But other than that, we're pretty flexible. We've We've identified that that's really important to them, um, and so we're working with them on that. And as the as the, the sort of the person running the, the business, with things such as meeting rhythms and cadences, what what does Evalesco's meeting cadence look like? Do you, you know is it is it structured? Um, yeah, give us a bit of a feel for if I'm working in your business, what are the non negotiables? How does it work? What you know? So typically, um, each pod will meet uh, once or twice a week. We do monthly round table meetings with our advisors. We do separate ones with our associates because um, obviously they focus on, can focus on different things. Um, I do fortnightly catch-ups with the admin team as well, um, which involves our Cebu team. Um, and then we've got fortnightly management meetings for the leadership team, um, which is chaired by Mark so he can provide input regularly. Um, that will probably push out to monthly eventually, but for now it's fortnightly. Uh, we've got monthly team meetings as well, and that's more business update type stuff, um, recognising achievements, birthdays, anniversaries, all that sort of fun stuff. That's where we share our financials as well with the team. We give them updates on the strategic plan, that sort of thing, just to bring them in the fold each month. Um, 
that's probably it. And just, I suppose, just confirming, the mark you're referring to is Mark Mark Bynum? Mark Mark Zaglis. Mark Zaglis. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mark Zaglis. Yeah. I'm. Uh, I was just 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 making sure I got that confirmation there. And with the the cadence there, so you're meeting with your operations team as collectively, and then do you do uh, sort of annual reviews or, or quarterly reviews individually? So we do uh, annual performance reviews. Yep. And on the back of that, training and development plans are set. Uh, we also have Jeff and I do monthly one-on-ones with each of the team, depending on who they are as to who they are with. Uh, but we do monthly one-on-ones, less formal, but sort of a check-in, try and not focus it on the day-to-day, more the bigger picture. I've looked at your website and you've got a few associate advisors there. Um, how do you know when they're ready to step up and be an advisor? And have you got any of it wrong? Have you left people too long or have you promoted people too early? Oh, they're probably still there, so we can't talk about them. But, but where did, you know, have you got it wrong before? Yeah, absolutely. We've made mista- m- mistakes for sure. Um, did you learn from them? Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, we'd still be making the same thing over and over again. Um, I think with the team – what we've identified and Jeff's really good at identifying this is he can see they're ready before they know they're ready. Um, So it's giving them that confidence really. They know the technical stuff, the soft skills and the confidence is really the the major step for a lot of associates. Um, So it's just making sure that we're pushing them as much as we can at the right time. And it's getting those first sort of dozen uh, sort of standalone meetings with clients Clients are clients are the good and fun part, you know. When you look at the ecosystem, they're the they're the most compliant people in our business model. Yeah. Um, especially if you've got the vetting and whatnot in there. So you're right. It's probably giving them that confidence and getting, you know, because the other way, promoting people too early can actually be quite problematic as well. And that does happen with some practices. And I've felt been guilty of that historically as well. Yeah. 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 I think so. Definitely. You mentioned you share your financials with your team, okay, um, and that's on a monthly basis, is that right? Yeah, high level, yep. monthly basis. Yep. And um, so, does that mean you've got some critical numbers? Um, like, is it is it revenue? Is it is it farm? Is it like what 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 um what are the critical numbers that that you like to look at in your lens? Yeah, it for us it's revenue um, because we've set some pretty big targets. Um, So we do regular check-ins on those targets with the team to make sure that we're tracking towards those. And I suppose if you wind the clock back, you mentioned that some of your pods have 80 family units and some have 130. Is there a a, a utopian number that you'd like um, everyone to get to? And and if if so, what what are you doing as the practice um, manager um, and general manager to to facilitate this? Yeah, I think we've thrown around high numbers of sort of that 175 upwards. Um, what I'm doing personally is looking at all the efficiencies and that's part of Zeppo, um, pushing that and rolling that through the business. But it's, it's those efficiencies that, that are going to allow that to happen and making sure that the team are aware of those and utilising those as much as they can. Let's snap our fingers and assume that you do your job well. What's the marketing engine behind Everlesco to be able to attract these new business clients? So we have a marketing manager. We do monthly webinars. Um, That's probably more focused on existing clients. That's where we find the most referrals come from. Um, So, And COVID really turned that and that became our key focus was because for a period of time, we just had to focus and focus on them. Um, So we pivoted and stopped the new business focus and it was just being there for our clients. And from that point forward, we've continued that. So it's newsletters became far more of a focus, updates, phone calls, webinars, the whole bit. Um, and since then, um, we've found that that's, that's the, been such a great focus and a source of new business as well. And you've invested the time and money in having a marketing person. Yep. Absolutely. Leading that and, and they would be accountable as well, I imagine. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, they are. So um, for practices out there um, looking to accelerate the number of uh, family groups that, that their advisors see, well, then you've got to do the work. You and- do. And we dabbled in different structures before. At one point, Marshall was doing all the marketing. At one point, I took it all on. Um, and it, we were just going around in circles and not really – 
cutting through. I can't see Marshall on a, on a 60-foot billboard advertising <laughs> no. uh, Evalesco with the twinkle in his eye. God love him. This is, I'm only saying that to see if he listens to this because I'll get a text message. Um, now, um, joining Evalesco, you know, like I, I often um, ask, you know, what makes people um, join and what makes them stay? Um, how do you recruit people? Yeah, for a long time there we were going through SEEK, doing it ourselves, it was a process and it was not a fun process um, sifting through that. So in the last couple of years, we have engaged with and built a really strong relationship with a recruiter um, who allows us to work – And sorry, that allows us to work with someone that understands our business, knows what we do, knows what we're looking for. Give him a shout-out. So that's Pat um, from Barbican. Um, so he has been amazing for us. The quality of candidates and people that are joining the team has certainly stepped up a notch. Um, since working alongside him, we've seen it. Yeah, it's it's been a game changer. And so does Pat do a lot of the heavy lifting around things like psych tests and, and, and stuff, or is there still a fair bit that goes into once the candidate's identified? Is there, you know, do you panel interview? Can maybe give it a feel? Yeah, so we um, meet with the team members initially, um, so Jeff and or I typically will meet with them um, and then we, if are interested, get them back for a second interview and at that point they'll meet with more of the team that they will be working directly with um, and that gives the current team um, a sense of ownership almost over those people and them coming along the journey but also allows us to suss out the culture fit. Um, from there, if they're successful, we then go on to case study. So we'll issue the we'll send them out a case study and get them to do a case study for us just to try and gauge where they're at. And just to clarify, you you and your role as GM, you're interviewing the uh, potential advisors. Yes. Yep. So yep. and so you're providing that that counterpoint to advisors interviewing advisors. Yes, correct. Why I thought that was an important question is lead advisors. Quite a few CEOs in our industry have been successful advisors who've trans, trans, sort of built themselves into CEO. And there's two types. There's ones that have actually reached out and got coaching and, you know, shared the burden and employed general managers. And there's others that just put a new title on their name because they're good at selling. They make terrible interviewers. And it's always good then to have that counterpoint mm. um, because everyone's awesome to them. You know, so it's like the Lego movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone's awesome yeah. and I can't wait for them to start. <laughs> and and you probably sit there sometimes going, yeah, but I think they're going to be a hot mess. Maybe not now because you've got the recruiter involved, but, yeah. but prior to that, yeah. you'd be like, I'm going to clean up a lot of mess with this person. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the training, so um, how's, how's your retention with, with, with your team, you know, your overall team? How do you find retaining them and, and, and keeping them and is – is it because you run, like you mentioned, you do a development and training plan? Mm -hmm. So what's your tips on that? Yeah, look, for us this year has actually been a little bit different. Um, rolling out our strategy and our plan um, has meant that some people ha aren't on the journey anymore with us. Um, we've had a little bit of turnover for the first time since I can remember. Um, in saying that, a lot of our team members are three, four, five plus years We've got a few at anywhere upwards of eight, nine, ten years, and obviously I'm 15. So we've certainly got some stayers um, and some that are part of the furniture, um, but there are some that aren't still on the journey, and that's okay. They've they've taken a different path, and we are fully supportive of that. And I look at um, when I when I met you uh, in person might have been a couple of years ago. It was actually in Cebu. It was actually at a, at a function. And, and, and um, you know, quite a few uh, of the practices um, on the engine room have, have uh, employed, um, you know, offshoring as part of their, their um, uh, the way in which they deliver their stuff. And I'm, I'm less interested in, in, in the efficiencies and the cost arbitrage than, than any advice you've got on how to manage them as uh, the people. So what tips would you have to people who either are listening to this and haven't done it or – are doing it at the moment and are a bit frustrated. Yeah, we have learnt the hard way. So we tried a couple of other businesses to partner with offshore um, and it didn't work. Um, and we found VBP and the difference we found was we had a dedicated resource. It wasn't just going to a team and someone was picking it up. We had a dedicated resource. And the key there is 
they're part of the team. They're just not in physically in our office. They have to be part of the team. They have to feel like they're part of the furniture. Um, and that has been an absolute game changer. And so, for instance, you know, you've got your Slack. They're communicating constantly. Yep. They feel part of the team. And then, look, that's a common a common theme and you've built a team over there as well which 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 works yeah um, and and the successful people i've interviewed regardless of the provider uh, there's a real commonality there that people are people yeah absolutely and we're really excited jeff and i are heading over actually in a couple of weeks for their conference um so we're really excited we're taking our team offshore we're, go- we're going across to one of the islands uh for a couple of days prior to the actual vbp conference so we're really excited to spend a good couple of days with the team and um What about your training plans? So, um, yeah, how do you implement? So, I'm I'm specifically going to ask about you running your operations part of the business Mm -hmm. because um, in a world where there's 3% unemployment um, and it's been a tough slog, like the thing with the regulatory change in financial advice in the last decade is everyone thinks the advisors have had a bad time and they have, but geez, the people who support them have done some big hours and had a lot of stress as well. So now that we've won the war, how do you win the peace as a manager for these people? Yeah, um, we've taken a little bit of a different approach this year where we've promoted a couple of people um, from our admin team. Um, So one has gone into a training and development specialist role and one has gone into a internal and client relations role. Um, so we identified those as key areas. So the training and development specialist looks after exactly that. Our onboarding, our ongoing training, process development, process enhancements, all that sort of thing. And the internal relations looks at more of the HR side of things. So she's checking in with new entrants, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's, that's been a huge change for me. I've had to let go. But it's also been awesome because I've got people that can help me. Um, and these two are amazing and they've taken so much off my load that I don't feel like I'm not achieving in every area because I know that they've got it. And they come to me with anything, but I know they've got it. So um, they're stepping into those new roles beautifully. Um, and I know the team are feeling far more supported as well. And that's been a big key driver is they needed more support and I didn't have enough man hours to do that. So it was recognising that. And look, I'm going off piece a bit here, but, um, you know, you can't be all things to all people as the GM, right? And um, I'm really interested in what are you doing personally or or I'll, I'll preface that. What are you doing or what would you like to be doing with your own personal and professional development in your role? What courses would you like to do or, or, or what would you – uh, how would you like to be more supported as a general manager? Um, I've gone through over the years, um, the guys have supported me and I've done a couple of leadership courses, um, which. Any standout courses in there? Um, I did one with Kylie Denton. That was great. Um, that was a two part course um, over a 14 week period, which happened awesome. to be in COVID, which was amazing because I was at home anyway, and I could just jump on and focus on it, it was actually really good timing. Um, she was phenomenal. Um, and now we're working really closely with Mark and Tom at Encore. Mark's doing a lot of coaching with Jeff and I, as we go through this process and in our fortnightly management meetings and all that sort of stuff. So I think the key is that leadership piece. A lot of people just fall into those roles and evolve into those roles because it's a business need. But without the right training, you're just going to keep fumbling. 100%. In fact, as I intimate, a lot of CEOs are, are, are planners who became CEOs and a lot of general managers are people who've been there and know the business really well. And I just see a distinct lack of intellectual and uh, community resources for practice managers and general managers or, or, and or general managers, um, which is the impetus for doing this podcast series. And further to that, um, quite ironically, one of the few places that I find a lot of G- GMs and practice managers get together is at that offshore operations conference. And it was never meant to be designed like that. But um, maybe if I could just pick your brains around, <clears throat> um, like if I'm an advisor and I was an advisor for years, We've got plenty of places to hang out with advisors. There's every second email is saying, hey, advisors get together. Yeah. What would you like to see 
for practice managers and general managers? Would you like to see more corporate um, companies sort of getting them together? Would you like to see more collaboration? Give, give us a, a blueprint on a perfect world because Ensemble definitely wants to, but we don't want to do things that, that aren't going to appeal to exactly the target market, which is you. Yeah, look, I think there's massive value in that. Um, obviously, being last year in Cebu, the benefit there has been huge um, in terms of broadening the circle and those that you can work with and share with. Um, at our license level as well, we find they're the most valuable sessions is talking at that business level, what's working, what's not, what's your tech what tech's working, what's not, what are you trialing, what are you seeing? Like it's all those sorts of things that aren't – you can't put in an email. It doesn't work. Face-to-face conversations then just open up and broaden and you start talking and going down different paths and find different things out. So, yeah, look, sessions like that are certainly have a place for sure. And so this is complete, uh, completely self-serving, but um, if you're listening out there and um, – uh, what am I talking about? Who's not? Um and, uh, and, and you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, really get into the, the hearts and minds of advisors. Well, the gateway to that is, is quite often in the, the medium to large businesses, their practice managers, their general managers, um, providing them the level of support that historically you've provided to the advisors and then cascading down the power planners and whatnot. Is, is something that that um, we really really recommend it and look and an ensemble is is doing that um, and but I think it is the this is the evolution <clears throat> um, if I look at the successful practices that are growing not going um, it is very much the 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 general manager is working out what works best for the business the the team members and the clients. Yeah. And that's a, a big departure from you're the operations manager who, who who's sort of very reactionary. Mm. Um, and uh, you have a pretty, you know, I'm increasingly seeing the general managers and practice managers being equity owners of the business, sharing in that because, you know, smart advisors have worked out they've got to have that counterpart. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is that sort of the way in which you feel about Evolesco and where you are? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that we are working towards. Um, as a business, the plan is to have that finalised by the end of the year and rolled out in the new year um, to longer term team members and then quite possibly to then others in the team as well. Yeah, I think people want to belong. They do. You know, like... Um, They're working hard. They want to be working hard for something. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And... and um and being part, you know, there's, there's a, you know, we've got millennials and we've got Gen Zs and, and I think they're much maligned. And, and I really think in the same way in which people, whether they're in this country or another country, people are people. I, stick, I think the different generations are all people are people as well. Mm. And there's nothing replacing that, that real feeling of, 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 of walking out your door in the morning and walking to a place where you feel valued and you feel you belong and you feel that you can be authentic and not judged. And, and, in saying that, that's sort of intimating that, that financial planning practices is just going to get, get bigger. And, and one of the, the, the questions I wanted to ask you was, what's your vision for the future of, of, of Evolesco? First question. Then the vision of how you see the industry going. You guys are a genuine, you're a multidiscipline practice in that you do the debt advice, um, and you do the financial planning. But by a bet, if I'm a client, I don't realize that. I just think you're helping me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and but but you know not all not all practices are like that. So yeah, what what do you see as the the vision for for your practice and and your role? Yeah, so I think they go hand in hand. Um, the aim that I'm working with is maximizing the performance of our people. And what? How do you define that? Maximizing the performance yeah. of our people. Yeah. Um, it's them realizing their potential and working hard at that. Um, and making sure that nothing's left on the table. What, what, what gets in their way? Um, their confidence, mm-hmm. absolutely. Compliance, um, which is certainly something that we're working on um, and trying to create more efficiencies um, and better use systems to help that um, without lowering our service standards. And that is it's a hard juggle at times. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, there's a point where you can become business ruthless, but at the end of the day, kind of our employers in this industry are the clients. Yeah. 
you when, know, so we've got yeah. a duty of care to make sure they're Abs- really happy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, because yeah. they can vote with their, their feet per se. But, yeah, yeah. so you're, can go back to, sorry, I interrupt, your, your role, um, your vision for um, the Evolesco business. Yeah, so working on maximising the performance of our people and our teams, um, leading to improved efficiencies and enhanced client experience. And that's what it's really coming down to is that client experience. We've got a big focus on that, um, making sure that our clients are getting that great experience every time that they come to us. So they feel safe, they feel secure, they feel supported in achieving their goals. So this is the user experience. So, you know, behind, under the line, you're investing well, you're doing correct life insurance, you're placing them in in, in in lenders that are both flexible and, and well-priced. Yep. You're already doing that. Yep. So what do you mean by increased sort of ex- positive experiences, given that you're already doing pretty well? Yep. So they've come to us to outsource. So we want to be able to do that for them. And having to tick all the boxes doesn't always allow that. So it's it's making sure that we're working towards taking that off their plate and doing as much for them as possible along the way so that they come to us and go, yep, yeah, I've t- ticked that goal through your help. And from experience, it's also sort of telling them that you've actually achieved the goal. Yes. Because quite often Absolutely. they're on the journey, and but every so often there needs to be a few stops on the train, right, uh-huh. to smell the roses yeah. and say, well, actually, we did the Look thing. Look at this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and are you, with Evolesco, are you looking to introduce any more service lines per se? Have you have you got – so at the moment you would be uh, with a lot of wealth accumulators, retirees, you, you would have an, an estate planning referral panel, I suggest? Yeah, we do. So we work closely with um, – there's solicitors, there's lawyers. Um, we've got an estate planning solution which is – very tight. So for anything more complex, it is referred out, but we do have an internal estate planning solution. And whose role is it to introduce that? The risk specialist. Okay, cool. They go hand in hand. Um, So he- Geez, this risk specialist is getting a bit of a plug (laughs) today, (laughs) you know? He is, he is. Um, So he he looks after that as well with his team. Um, Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And what about the roles of general managers or practice managers in other practices, where do you see practices going in the future um, with the backdrop of what's happened? Yeah, I think the role is to start stepping into that visionary role within the business. That typically comes from leaders, owners, CEOs, typically. GMs sort of just make it all happen. Um, but I've been working really closely with the guys over the last couple of years and being able to be exposed to those new ideas at a different level um, has really meant that I bring a different perspective and we can collectively come together as a leadership team to make decisions and offer those different perspectives when decision-making comes about. Um, So I think that's a a big thing. If if you're investing in, in that GM role, allow them in to that. Um, because it can definitely bring different perspectives and different thought processes and ideas to the table that you may not have thought of as a CEO or a head advisor or just the business owner standalone. Um, so it's, yeah, bringing that in. And um, the where Evales goes at the moment, uh, as far as growing, are you in the market for, you know, you've, you've, you've mentioned you've got your pod structure, you're looking to increase up from sort of the 130, 175. Um, is Evalesco in 2023 in the market for new ARs, um, are, are associate advisors? Associate advisors are actually pretty alluring because there's a, a real kind of um, a, a lack of new entrants coming through. I know that um, uh, Ensemble with, with the, 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 the generous support of, of CFS have got a, a PY program on, on their, their platform, but yeah, what, what's Evalesco looking for? Or would you be merging or, or bringing people in? What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think f- for the 2023 year, um, through some changes and having our admin team offshore and through this, some promotions, we're looking to feel a really good experienced admin role initially, um, but it typically comes down to good people. The And I say the admin role because it's the client relationships that are really important. We've got great advisors. We've got great associates. We've got a great team. We just need a little bit more hands-on doing at the moment. Um, so, people who are confident in talking with the clients as absolutely. well. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah it's a rare, rare beast who's confident in talking with their own team and also with the clients. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I think that um, not only, you know, my takeaways is that there needs to be more structured uh, support for uh, GMs and practice managers, potentially even a, 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 a course that could be um, you yeah. know, manufactured. So, uh, uh, sound guy, um, we might be talking about that afterwards. <laughs> um, and, um, and also, you know, good quality practice has been good quality advice, has been good quality advice, and the stakeholders in that are uh, the general public. And, and I think that um, we've always needed the general public on board, and, but I think, you know, coming out of the, the last 10 years, I think that if we can really, uh, you know, press upon that, mm. then we're going to see tailwinds in our industries rather than headwinds. And look, it's been a, a, a cracking um, uh, time with you today, Blinda. I've been really keen to get this one, um, this particular podcast done. Um, I see the growth in your business. So I see it from from an outsider, but also looking at some of your engine room. And um, don't underestimate the role that, that you bring as the glue in your business. And I'm sure that you get told this from time to time, but I'm telling you again. So it was wonderful having you on the engine room. Thanks, Roxy. I really appreciate it.